Hello again. We're back with Ian Baldwin. We're still here. Haven't gone anywhere. And we're going to go back to the beginnings of geoengineering, how it all started, and why it all started, and even where it all started. And something happened after Kennedy expressed the benefits of geoengineering and President Johnson did the same. It turned out that there were some dangers in geoengineering, and a certain reporter named uh, Will Thomas discovered what they were because of anecdotal reports at first, people flooding into the emergency rooms because of damage to them as a result of something that they noticed, literally they could see, falling out of the sky. So that was a little extreme, but it indeed uh, since he was a real journalist and not a fake journalist, he thought that was worth covering, and he was allowed to do so. And these reports became nationwide information until, and we'll turn it over to Ian now, uh, because he has the story on what happened and why it happened in the middle of what was apparently a very successful geoengineering move and then hopefully we will have time to explain the, the the real word for those things that were up in the sky which we call chemtrails today and some people faint when they hear the term and sort of go after you but that's what they are they're trails in the sky made of chemicals and will thomas discovered that and so uh, ian baldwin take it away <laughs> all right jim uh the, your listeners may have heard of the term geoengineering because it is, it's entered our vocabulary only in recent years. Yes, military planners have used the word long before us. And in the context in which most people read and hear about the term, it is a future event that is supposed to help us cope with global warming or climate change. Mm -hmm. So they then point us to Mount Pinatubo, which exploded in, in uh, 1991, sent tons of material into the stratosphere. Now the stratosphere is a huge band above the lower atmosphere called the troposphere. The stratosphere will stretch roughly, roughly 30,000 feet or 33,000 feet, way, way up, 100,000 feet. 60,000 feet is where most geoengineers, academic blackboard geoengineers, say reflective metals like aluminum, or sulfites, spates, should be put to, just like the volcano, Mother Nature did, reflect the sun's incoming rays back into space. Mm -hmm. And that 1% of total energy reflected back results in an offsetting cooling to the ongoing global warming, okay? But what people have observed over the last 70 years, and especially the last 20, is that a secretive geoengineering that isn't blackboard, it's actually up there, has been happening with increasing prevalence. Mm -hmm. And that is taking place 30, I'm going to give rough measurements, 10 to 35,000 feet. So mm -hmm. primarily in the upper troposphere and lowermost stratosphere, mm -hmm. where it behaves, those particulates behave differently. They're mm -hmm. used than the ones in the stratosphere. In the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. So uh, they act to cool, I mean to heat, they cool way, way, way up. 
Mm -hmm. But closer to Earth, they act to heat. Why? Because they're partially, per there are a lot of reasons, and I'm not going to take the time to go into all of them, but they're partially permeable to incoming heat and impermeable to radiated back heat. Ah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you will see that nighttime temperatures have increased more than daytime temperatures. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason for that. So uh, the U.S. military uh, used aluminum, or uh, I think copper ch chaff, no, it was aluminum, I believe, to disorient the Germans' radar systems. So the military started playing around with this stuff uh, in the 40s. And in 1947, uh, a young scientist working for GE, Vincent Schaefer, who worked with Bernard Vonnegut, the Kurtz uh, brother, ah. uh, the two of them discovered, hey, we can fly into a, uh, a potential snowstorm and throw out, um, you're going to have to help me. I'm, I'm blanking on the word. It's just an ordinary uh, coalescer of, of, of H2O. Uh, oh. Anyway, I'm blanking. Yeah, yeah, me let's too. Not, mm -hmm. Let's not get hung up on that. And you can cause a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Indeed, they, they, they put it out. Indeed, the snowstorm happened. And uh, they, they were working for a Nobel laureate, so he was definitely being watched by the army. Mm -hmm. Within three months, that Schenectady GE office belonged to the army. And the army was on its way to steering hurricanes, one of which got aborted off of Savannah, which backed them off of hurricane research. And in the 50s, there are plenty of documents from high powerful government people, federal government people, saying weather is the next warfare weapon. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a decade, and you have the Ho Chi Minh Trail and rain being forced over the Ho Chi Minh. Make mud, not war. Hmm. It was this when the French were? No, no, no. It was in the 60s. In we the were 60s, doing this. After the the French didn't have took this over technology. From the French. Yeah. Okay. So it was when all of that was exposed, because it was top secret, no one knew about it. Mm -hmm. When I say no one, I mean no one. Mm -hmm. As you need to know, you know. Like the Manhattan and Project. Like the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. So um, when this got exposed, um, around the same time as the Pentagon Papers. It was part of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, Congress had all sor sorts of reactions and held meetings, and, and the international community was a, in an uproar. Mm -hmm. And they passed something called NMOD. And I've forgotten what NMOD, uh, I'll just mess it up, but it's a UN law mm -hmm. that says you cannot modify the environment, an N environment mod. Modify. Okay. Well, you cannot do it. The, the 2001 proposal that I have, Congress in session, H.R. 2977, uh, I believe Kucinich had something to do with that. Um, Space Preservation Act of 2001 introduced in the House. That strikes me as the same kind of thing that you're talking about from the UN, yeah. and it acknowledged what was happening. Yes. Well, the, you have to remember, when NMOD came along, this vast machinery of the military, mm -hmm. plugged into by the scientific university and industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Where do we go now? We got some 
some big projects here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to let the UN shut us up. Mm -hmm. So then came Star Wars. Edward Teller was always on the forefront of these things. Mm -hmm. and, and Reagan listened to Teller. Mm -hmm. And so they went ahead despite Kennedy and others belittling it. And Kennedy was the one who, Edward Kennedy was the one who derided it as Star Wars. Because mm -hmm. the movie had just come out two years before. Uh -huh. yeah. so, but Star Wars was serious. Mm -hmm. And the fruit uh, came in the 90s. This gets, I, I don't know how, how much detail to go into for your, for your listeners, but it, they may remember the Cold War ended. Mm -hmm. Between 1989 and 1990 war, it ended. Mm -hmm. We got a problem, Houston. Who's our enemy? That was half of it. The other half was, this is our opportunity. Let's dominate the whole earth and everyone in it. Full spectrum dominance. Full spectrum dominance. And we didn't invent the term. No, we did not. It was invented by uh, Paul Wolfowitz working as a deputy for Dick Cheney, who was then in Bush One's administration Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. And um, David Ray Griffin covers this beautifully in his book, How Bush and Cheney Ruined the World. Yes. The U.S. and the world. I yes. did a program about that with Claudia, by the way. Yes. The, the question's a little more complicated than pinning it yes. on a old Bush Cheney. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cheney is one of my favorite villains, but mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, it is a little more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, y y you have a decision at a very strategic level that then pops up in a lot of military documents mm -hmm. saying how do we get full spectrum dominance over all physical media, mm -hmm. outer and space, atmosphere, oceans, earth, mm -hmm. communications, computers, how do we dominate the whole matrix. And this is one of the ways that they ex ahead. instructed their personnel. Well, this is that. this is very yeah. interesting. If you can the, I don't know whether we can get Oh, this will Yeah, you go. Right we'll we'll get it on my camera or your camera. Give it to me and I will uh, take it up there. And don't uh, forget your microphone. Yeah, I won't. I'll try not to. So, uh, well, there. That is a manual. From the US, by the Air Force. The U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. So in 1990, yes, that's correct, the first entity to use the word chemtrails was the U.S. Air Force. And they used it on the front jacket of their introduction to chemistry. Mm -hmm. Chem 131 for the U.S. Air Force Academy students. Mm -hmm. Very smart students. So um, uh, that's worth bearing in mind because when Will Thomas came along, first of all, it wasn't his idea. Will Thomas worked in the Gulf during um, Gulf War I, Iraq War I. And he worked specifically on the environmental and human health damages done from the variety of weaponry used. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he had a reputation. He was reporting, he was an on-the-ground reporter, uh, a freelance reporter for the Environmental News Service, which was a fairly new worldwide news service. So they knew him. Mm -hmm. They got a video, ENS got a video, Environmental News Service got a video from a guy in rural Washington state showing very strange patterns of aircraft mm -hmm. over his part of the world. Mm -hmm. And that would have been in 1997. Mm -hmm. So his editor, uh, Thomas's editor said, would you take a look at this video? Because Thomas was also trained as a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, he said, sure, send it. So he started looking at it with a friend and started laughing. He said, these are just contrails. And then he said, no. He 
he got deeper into it, he said, wait a minute, those are not contrails. They're, the patterns are too close, mm -hmm. and they're cross-hatching, mm -hmm. they're doing other things. This is not contrails. So he then accepted the assignment to follow up on this guy's evidence. And he never used the word chemtrail. That was invented by the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So then he went out and he interviewed through the guy, William Wallace was his name, said, you gotta go talk to this dentist in Bakersfield, California. You gotta go talk to this ex Raytheon guy down in Tennessee. And he pulled together out of 400 interviews, two short stories. All they did was report on massive health complaints all over the country. Crowded emergency rooms, as you said earlier. You know, respiratory problems, memory loss problems, temporary ones, mm -hmm. uh, and other kinds of problems. And uh, that is when, because those stories were published, by a reputable, out-of-the-ghetto source, they had to get dealt with. And that's where Jay Reynolds shows up. Okay. But in the meantime, it was broadcast and dis distributed, disseminated all over the country. Art Bell got hold of Will Thomas roughly at the same time. I don't know how that happened. Mm -hmm. And he went on Art Bell and became Art Bell's, he says, most popular guest, but certainly one of his most popular guests, which mm -hmm. took everyone by surprise. Now, Art Bell's show, what is it called? I don't remember. Coast to Coast. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 15 million viewers, mm -hmm. listeners, late night. Mm -hmm. And that blew it. That was the crack, that was the Pinatubo of the mm -hmm. anti geoengineering movement. Mm -hmm. There are many other players. It's not just Will Thomas. There, if if you, people re, w are curious and they want to read at Vermont Independent mm -hmm. the latest, uh, my latest story on this, they will see who, who the people are who brought it up mm -hmm. as an issue. And that's so important that I, I want to congratulate Rob Williams for his uh, work in working with you and getting this out there to the public yep. and anybody paying attention today would realize why it's at Vermont independent on the positive side because we believe in research, we believe in science, we believe in getting the truth out there. So that's why it's there. On the other hand, you may be wondering why isn't it anywhere else? Well, from what you've heard today, you hopefully have figured out why it isn't anywhere else. And so please, if you are curious about this, uh, look at all nine of Ian Baldwin's historic papers at vermontindependent.net. And they're all published there. I'm not, the, the, the way that you use the search has yeah, I, changed a bit, but it, they're all there. Yeah, I think it's not a problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, if I want to access one of them, I just say Ian Baldwin Geoengineering, boink, up, okay. up it comes. Well, it's harder for all of my articles because they're all on a completely different topic. <laughs> yeah. So there's the, the yeah, banking right. history, right. there's 9-11 right. you know, right. right. history, there's all those. those. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yes, please go, to, go there and take a look at that. And I also want to thank Claudia for her work in helping us Claudia Stauber. Claudia Stauber, whose um, channel Who's, is Cabin Talk yep. on YouTube. Um, so that will Continue. be a companion piece to the two programs that we're doing today, and it will fill in. Actually, it goes a little bit more into some of the villains yes. in the story. Yes. And, and some of you may be wondering, those of you watching on local probably believe that Bill McKibben has been a big help to the environmental movement. But if he's only covering like one-tenth of the problem and he's not looking at real solutions, like solutions by Abe Collins who understands mm -hmm. the carbon cycle 
and how you uh, take care of the carbon problem through agriculture. Mm -hmm. And we also have to touch today on, before I forget, the global warming aspect of geoengineering All right. and chemtrails. It, yes. it, we okay. don't have much time, but that's yeah. a biggie. That's a very, very big subject. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. um, the particulate matter in yes. the New York Times story yes. and how that is actually contributing not to cooling the planet by reflecting yeah. solar, yeah. but making the planet warmer. Well, uh, on January 19th, 2017, the New York Times on the front page spread across the top was a graph, a really interesting graph, that had a curve that went something like that. Mm -hmm. And the bump, if you weren't used to looking at such graphs, you might miss the bump. Mm -hmm. Well, a researcher named Gottschalk at Harvard saw the bump, saw the dates correlated with it, mm -hmm. and decided to play with it and, and in a, a sense, make that noise get m less staticky and clear. Mm -hmm. So he then published two he pre-published two science papers. So if you do a science paper, a serious piece of work, you can put it up somewhere on the internet. Again, I've, 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 I've lost the exact provenance, but all mm -hmm. scientists use it, before it gets accepted for publication. Because mm -hmm. the, the acceptance process or rejection process can take months. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, scientists in the same field want to know what's going on now, mm -hmm. not five months from now. Mm -hmm. So he put it up there and uh, somehow, and Herndon, being a scientist, perused it, found it, got in touch with Gottschalk and said, may I reprint your two figures? Mm -hmm. And Gottschalk gave him permission provided he printed them exactly as he had them. Mm -hmm and that he stated what his conclusions were and differentiated his own. Mm -hmm. So Herndon did that. And I think it's, from Gottschalk's point of view, what it shows is that pollution, air particulate pollution, is been, has been rising steadily for a century. Okay, mm -hmm. but most graphically, in the 1940-45, you get a bump out of the out of the curve up. You get a bump like a like a dinosaur's whatever mm -hmm. hump, and that's World War II, when huge amount of particulates were spewed out over the globe on that two front global war. Mm -hmm. Explosions, expenditure of energy beyond anything seen before, mm -hmm. and it took, it took quite a while to catch back up to the top of the pump. Mm -hmm. we're, way, we're way past it now. And we're way past it now. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things these particulates do, as I said in the first show, they trap infrared heat when they're in the troposphere and lower stratosphere. Mm -hmm. They trap it. They don't let it escape. So they interfere with Earth's thermal balance. The focus on CO2, it's a little like a chicken and an egg, which came first. But according to Herndon, who's a geoscientist, who has many theories about how Earth formed and so forth, the gas follows the heat, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Well, that should be easy to verify. It's not so easy. Okay. It's not so easy. But one thing is known. The, if they heat the oceans through what a, a sub-oceanic sub, uh, volcanism, 80% of volcanism is happening at the, mm 
mm -hmm. at the bottom of the ocean. Yes. If you heat the oceans, they are going to release CO2, mm -hmm. and they're the main storehouse of CO2 on Earth. Okay. So heat definitely will drive CO2 up. Will CO2 cause heat through the trapping medium that science talks about? Yes, it, it, it does. So the exact interaction, I, I'm not okay. qualified to explain. Okay, well, I'm glad you we yeah, yeah. opened that wound. But we are in a conundrum. Herndon is in a conundrum over, he's just published a, a grippingly important, potentially, paper. Yeah. It's in the science ghetto. It's published by a very good Indian journal, mm -hmm. but it's not in Nature. It's not in Science, which is AAAS. It's not in the Royal Society or the Proceedings, where it should be. Yeah. This may seem arcane to people, but this is, this is like life and death stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am very concerned about how to get this paper discussed. It's not a proof, mm -hmm. but it is very interesting data. Mm -hmm. And people like our friend Bill McKibben are not going to welcome it because I'm guessing, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. because carbon dioxide is the yeah. villain and everyone mm -hmm. knows it's the villain. And that's his career. So they're not prepared to get off the consensus science horse, which Herndon says is bullshit, mm -hmm. because science is not about consensus. It's about argumentation, fact-finding, thesis-proving, digging, counter-argument, mm -hmm. and debate. Mm -hmm. So I assume Dane Wigington and Ilana will kind of, Ilana Freeland will somehow maybe help once, once this paper, I mean, that, Ilana reads stuff like that. Whoa, yeah. we've got to go. We've got to go. Um, <laughs> so this is the second half of a one hour discussion of geoengineering with Ian Baldwin. And, um, Thank you very, very much for listening. The companion piece is on Cabin Talk. This will be on, uh, those of you looking at it at Orca, this will be on House at Pooh Corner with Jim Hogue.